It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're going to talk about the infamous story of Abraham and Isaac. This is by far one of the most infamous stories among skeptics when it comes down to the whole entire case for the Bible. So what exactly are the origins when it comes down to this infamous story? Now, the book of Genesis was written down roughly around 1200 to 1400 BCE. Now, the question that becomes is why exactly is this story so incredibly infamous? Well, let's look at the audiobook and just compare and contrast the information within it. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. As you guys can see, the information presented in the story is uh, <laughs> pretty rough to say the least. Now, when it comes down to information about historical Abraham, by far, according to most biblical scholars, we don't necessarily have any sort of direct information that actually demonstrates that Abraham is actually a real person. In other words, it seems as though that the Abraham character is actually a character within the story and not necessarily a person that we can actually demonstrate. So the question then becomes, where exactly did this story come from? What exactly is this origin? Now, Phoenicia was an ancient civilization that was composed of an independent city-state located along the coast of the Mesopotamian Sea, stretching through what is now Syria, Lebanon, and northern Israel. The Phoenicians were a great maritime people known for their mighty ships adorned with horse heads in honor of their god of the sea, Yam, the brother of Mot, the god of death. Now, the Phoenician city-states began to take form roughly around 3200 BCE, and were firmly established by 2750 BCE. Phoenicia strived as a maritime trader and manufacturing center from 1500 to 332 BCE, and was highly regarded for their skill in shipbuilding, glass making, the production of dries, and the impressive level of skill and the manufacture of luxury and common goods. The city-states of Phoenicia flourished through maritime trade between 1500 and 322 BCE, when the major cities were conquered by Alexander the Great, and after his death, 
the region became a battleground in the fight between his generals for secession and empire. It is also said that many of the gods of ancient Greece were imported from Phoenicia there as certain indisputable similarities in some stories concerning the Phoenician gods Baal and Yam and the great deities of Zeus and Poseidon. It is also noticeable that the battle between the Christian god and Satan as related in the book of Revelation see the much later version of the same conflict with many of the same details one finds in the Phoenician myth of Baal and Yam. Now the main source that we're going to use for this comparison comes directly from the theology of Philegians. But the Acceleries of Alice, who is Kronos, who we're called Elohim as it were, the Alice of Kronos, being so called at the Kronos, and Kronos having a son called Sidereus, the passion with his own sword, because he held him in suspension, and with his own hand the pride of his child of life, and in like matter he cut off the hand of his own daughter, so that all the gods were astonished at the position of Kronos. So what exactly is Kronos? What exactly is his backstory according to Greek mythology? For he had heard from Gaia and from Stare Uranus that it had been ordained for him, for all his great strength, to be beaten by his son, and through the designs of great Zeus. Therefore he kept watch and did not sleep, but waited for his children and swallowed them. And Rhea's sorrow was beyond, and those who on the grey-green, the hard-racking sea, make a living. And they pray to Hecate, and to the deep thunderous earth-shaker, and lightly the high goddess grants a great haul of fish. And, lightly too, she takes it away when it has shown, if such is her pleasure. She is great in the farms also, to help Hermes swell the produce, and the driven herds of cattle, and the wide-ranging goat flocks, and the flocks of deep-fleeced sheep. All these also at her own pleasure, she waitens to many out of few, or makes few out of many. Thus, though she is only the single child of her mother, she is honoured with high offices among all the immortals. Zeus, son of Cronus, made her too protector of those children who after her laid eyes on the dawn, the many light beaming. So she from the beginning has protected children, and these are her offices. Rhea, submissive in love to Cronos, bore glorious children, Histia and Demeter, Hera of the golden sandals, and strong Hades, who under the ground lives in his palace and has a heart without pity. The deep thunderous earth-shaker, and Zeus of the councils, who is the father of gods and of mortals, and underneath whose thunder the whole wide earth shudders, but as each of these children came from the womb of its mother to her knees, great Cronus swallowed it down with the intention that no other of the proud children of the line of Uranus should ever hold the king's position among the immortals. For he had heard from Gaia and from Stare Uranus that it had been ordained for him for all his great strength to be beaten by his son, and through the designs of great Zeus. Therefore he kept watch and did not sleep, but waited for his children and swallowed them. And Rhea's sorrow was beyond forgetting. But when she was about to bear Zeus, the father of mortals and gods, then Rhea went and entreated her own dear parents, and these were Gaia and starry Uranus, to think of some plan by which when she gave birth to her dear son, the thing might not be known, and the fury of revenge be on devious devising Cronus the Great for his father and his own children whom he had swallowed. They listened gladly to their beloved daughter, and consented, and explained to her all that had been appointed to happen concerning Cronus, who was king, and his son of the powerful spirit, 
and sent her to Lictus, in the fertile countryside of Crete, at that time when she was to bring forth the youngest of her children, great Zeus. And the earth, gigantic Gaia, took him inside her in wide Crete, there to keep him alive and raise him. There earth arrived through the running black night, carrying him, and came first to Lictus, and holding him in her arms, hid him in a cave in a cliff, deep in under the secret places of earth, in Mount Aigaion, which is covered with forest. She wrapped a great stone in baby clothes, and this she presented to the high lord, son of Uranus, who once ruled the immortals. And he took it then in his hands and crammed it down in his belly, hard wretch, nor saw in his own mind how there had been left him, instead of the stone, a son, invincible and unshakable for the days to come, who, soon by force and his hands defeating him, must drive him from his title, and then be lord over the immortals. And presently after this the shining limbs and the power of the lord Zeus grew great. And with the years circling on great Cronus, the devious devising, fooled by the resourceful promptings of Gaia, once again brought up his progeny. First he vomited up the stone, which last he had swallowed, and this Zeus took and planted in place on earth of the wide ways at holy Pytho, in the hollow ravines under Parnassus, to be a portent and a wonder to mortal men thereafter. Then he set free from their dismal bonds the brothers of his father, the sons of Uranus, whom his father in his wild temper had enchained, and they remembered and knew gratitude for the good he had done them, and they gave him the thunder and the smoky bolt and the flash of the lightning which Gaia the gigantic had hidden till then. With these to support him, he is lord over immortals and mortals. Maybe it's me, but it seems as though by using the name Kronos to refer to El, what they're trying to do is say that the god El and that Kronos, the god of Greek mythology, is basically just one of the same thing by referring to it the same name. So in other words, it seems as though that in that story, it's actually El that's actually, of course, one to, of course, kill his son. Now, this is really interesting because this whole entire text was released roughly the same time as the book of Genesis. This text was written down roughly around 1200 BCE, give or take. So, what do you guys think about this comparison? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.